obviously trying to work in a little bit of pop culture here, but you wouldn't believe, quite frankly, the number of random inquiries I get into my email about <laughs> what should I eat, Dr. Thompson? And I'm like, well, I, I actually don't know what you should eat. But they all want to know about meat. And it's because of a paper that Zarai mentioned that we co-authored, which kind of goes through the evidence for when do we actually suspect that the consumption of large mammal tissues became a part of what it is that humans do. And then why do we even care about that? Obviously, pe people care about that now today because it's, it's an industry, right? And they, and they worry about diet and what they should put in their bodies. But we care about that in paleoanthropology for a number of reasons that we outlined in the paper. And um, I'm going to kind of talk today a little bit about what I think we are trying to do next with that information, but then also what it was about the discovery of, of Lucy that, that helped us to understand something a little bit different that hadn't been known before about early hominin diet. And I love that I've had so much lead up from, you know, I don't have to go into the background about things like brain size and tool use. I can, I can know that you already know all of that. And I've got this beautiful photo as well that um, Don Johansson was so kind to give me when we were out there in 2012. But I thought it might be appropriate to just start with a food-related quote. Um, there's a lot of food-related quotes on the internet. And I liked this one because it kind of reminded me of you know, the centrality of food in our own lives, but also that dichotomy between what is human and the human-like relationship to food and then what is not human. And I think there's this sense that something that isn't human doesn't think a lot about what they're eating or what they're doing. And they don't require a lot of sort of cognition to get it. Um, they basically are there to eat, survive, and reproduce. Um, we still need food to do that, as Virginia Woolf has outlined here, to love well, sleep well, um, and we have to dine well. But what about this thinking part? And is there something about Australopithecus afarensis that can tell us about the emergence of the relationship between human diet and human cognition? So what, what Lucy really gave us was, as we've seen, a, you know, a complete picture of an individual organism that you can imagine walking around, that you can see not just as an isolated skull, but actually as, as an individual. And the thing is that, as we've also seen, she started this chain of discoveries from which we learned so much more. And so I'm going to kind of introduce this concept that maybe she also set the foundation for the other piece of this quote, too, which is the learning and the thinking aspect of what it is that humans do that's different from what it is that a lot of other organisms do, and specifically with respect to what they eat. Um, I also wanted to put a quote in here from Bill Kimball. This is not going to be written down anywhere. I think he told it to me maybe in the field. But he just basically said, these were brainy apes. And I remember that quote a lot because I was kind of floored by it. Because the conventional wisdom was always, well, no, Australopithecus had an ape-sized brain. And in, in fact, she did. But it's on the higher end of an ape-sized brain. And I hadn't really thought about the implications of what that would actually mean in terms of what she needed to be putting into her body in order to feed that brain. Because the human brain, for example, is massive, it's monstrous, it's way oversized, and it weighs a mere 2% of our entire body mass, but consumes something like 20% of our daily energy requirements, just existing and being there in our body. So we have to really need that brain, and we have to have a reliable way of feeding that brain in order to have evolved it in the first place, maintained it over evolutionary time. And that means we have a lot of questions about the relationship between our thinking and our eating habits. It also means that as soon as you start to see a slightly larger brain in any organism in the fossil record, you have to suspect that something has changed with respect to their energy balance. So their energy that's going in has to be a little bit more than the energy that's going out in order to actually achieve the ability to maintain this brain. So then you kind of get yourself into this feedback loop, right? So if you start to exploit resources that require you to be a little smarter or have a little bit bigger brain, and then you're having selection that's driving that, then you kind of get yourself stuck, right? Because now you are in a niche that demands you to have a slightly more advanced way of thinking about food and not just going out and acquiring it the way that maybe your predecessors did before they had that slightly larger brain. So this kind of feedback is something that has been long discussed. This is the kind of traditional human origins narrative. We've, we've seen this um, so far. But the idea is that all of these things kind of come out in the context of tool use. 
And so you have this idea that flight stone tools uh, appear in the fossil record or in the archaeological record, that their purpose was to cut meat, and specifically off of large animals, large game that might have been scavenged or hunted, and that this meat offers this really high quality diet. And by high quality, I mean lots of nutrition going in without a lot of outlay. So you have this energy surplus. Then um, the idea is that from this, you get the emergence of Homo. And what is Homo if not a thinking ape, right? It is a hunting thinking ape that uses lots of tools. So Homo emerges from Australopithecus with larger brains, smaller back teeth, and that's because their diets are now facilitated by tool use. And it's a beautiful, beautiful story. And it's one that I learned as an undergraduate and then a grad student. And it's still, it's still there, but I think we, it's time for us to add a little bit of nuance to that. So what we now know is that stone tools were in use, as we've seen, already during Lucy's time. And this is flake stone tools. So what does this tell us about the relationship between diet and specifically meat eating? And we've also seen that there's some evidence for meat eating in the time period when Lucy was around. Um, but if we look a little bit more carefully at the nutritional composition of food, that gives us something to think about as well. And, and this kind of relates to the emails that I get from people like, what should I eat? How much protein do I need? How much fat do I need? I don't know. And I'm not going to tell you today either. But what I can tell you is that fat is a very nutritionally dense type of macronutrient. And it's much more so than protein. So sort of per gram of fat, you're going to get more calories back than per gram of protein. Now, the same is true for carbohydrates. Carbohydrates also give you a lot of energy back. So when we're talking about this kind of tool use in the context of diet, we want to be thinking a little bit more carefully and with nuance about the relationship between the macronutrient properties of the foods and not just was it an animal or not an animal that was being consumed. And then we also, I, I think, can now pretty safely suspect that some of the dietary shifts we know became really important later for the emergence of Homo, us, uh, were, were set in the time of Lucy, and that she really was already on the path towards a lot of these foundational shifts that would have been necessary to do a lot of the things that we start to observe in the fossil record, especially after two million years ago, that really speak to like something that looks more diagnosably and obviously human. The obvious question here is, can I tell you what Lucy ate then? You know, that, that should be the answer to this. And you know, the answer is I, I unfortunately can't. Um, that's exciting because that means there's a lot of work left to do. But when you look at an animal's ecology, you look at its tooth shape, you look at where it lives in the modern day or where its relatives live, and you can observe things like, you know, that antelope eats grass, it has teeth that look like this, this giraffe eats leaves, it has teeth that look like that. And then you can also make inferences about kind of their in extinct ancestors. The problem with Lucy is there was nothing else like her that ever lived before, and there was nothing li else like her that lived afterwards. And we have nothing like her living today, at least exactly like her. So how do we reconstruct the ecology of something that is so unusual and so unique? And what we got to do is we got to think, I think, a little bit more um, convergently about this problem. So first of all, the when, the why, the where, the how, right? the who, what, when, where. It's like a forensic case. So where did she live? Well, her discovery placed her in a, as we've seen, a mosaic savanna ecosystem. And it started to bring into focus something that the South African fossils didn't give us, and that is the ecological context of where Australopithecus lived. We now had actual other organisms that coexisted in the same spaces, in the same environments, and we had more confidence that that's more or less where they died, as opposed to that's more or less where they were dragged by predators and dropped into caves, which was really the situation in South Africa. We've also seen um, that when Lucy was discovered, we didn't have a very good way of dating the fossils from South Africa. And so what Lucy's discovery also did was enabled us to place that skeleton and the adaptations we observe in the actual time period when they happened. And we've seen how significant that is. So all of this gives us information about communities and the communities of organisms that live together and feed together and compete with each other on the same kind of landscape. So what is the actual evidence for dietary adaptations? And I, I think I, I have the word adaptation underlined here because there's a couple things here. There's what you're well adapted to do, which means your ancestors needed that and did that. And then there's the other bit, which is the next slide, which is like, what did they actually do? Because at some point, of course, there's going to be a period of time when you are not doing the same thing that you have been evolved to do, and you are going to be evolving onward. 
So what's the evidence for what she could have done and what she could have been good at? Well, the brain was slightly larger than your average chimp, but not a lot. But I do think that's an important point. It does mean that she required a high quality diet. And chimpanzees require a high quality diet too. They get most of it from fruit. So she couldn't have been subsisting on these tough, fibrous tubers solely, for example, because most of them are tough and fibrous, and they aren't actually that rich in the carbohydrates and the lipids that are the most energy, like nutritionally dense uh, items. Now, it doesn't mean she didn't eat them. It just means that we can start to put some guardrails around what is and isn't actually possible for her to have consumed and then also still maintain that slightly larger brain. We know she could have eaten tough foods. There is some mixed information about this based on tooth wear, which is on the next slide. Um, Definitely, the chewing musculature and those big teeth suggest that her ancestors would have been very good at doing that, and she could have done it also. Um, we know that she had rather short legs and long arms. Um, wasn't probably an endurance runner, so to speak. So we've looked at the kind of postprania. Uh, definitely an efficient biped, but not going to be hunting down large prey. Um, but a dedicated biped. And so this means also that she was in habitats that were going to be novel in that lineage overall in comparison to other things like antelope, for example. Now the evidence for the actual behavior, what did they do? Again, if we have our giraffe and we have our antelope, um, we can look at tooth wear patterns. And the information here has been, despite some early optimism, it's pretty mixed. Um, it doesn't look like they, that the Strelopithecus overall ate a lot of hard, brittle foods, things like nuts, for example. It doesn't look like they chewed a lot of tough foods. But remember, there's this like last meal effect with tooth wear, where this is all the scratches and the pits on the surfaces of teeth. And it's the last couple of days to weeks of what that organism was eating. So if you're getting a real snapshot of a diet that was very uh, flexible and varied, you might not necessarily be getting a consistent picture. And this kind of feeds into what Kay Reed was talking about with the changing of habitats around the time when Lucy was, um, was walking on this earth. The tooth chemistry is a little more informative, but unfortunately, this really just gives us kind of more in the treed area of the habitat or more in the you know, grassland area of the habitat. Um, there are some new approaches on the horizon that are maybe going to allow us to get more in depth about the actual meat eating question. But this has long perplexed people because what you can do is you can have an organism that has a tooth geochemical signature of like grass, but they're not eating grass. They're eating bugs that eat grass or they're eating animals that eat grass. So you know it kind of follows through the, the trophic web in that way. The important takeaway of this picture is look how variable Australopithecus was. It was not a predictable diet. This is part of the most sort of simultaneously interesting and also challenging aspects of trying to reconstruct the diet here of an organism we don't have a great modern analog for. And it's pretty clear, if there's a single takeaway, that Lucy was doing something dietarily that was very different from what other organisms did. You know, you can think of it however you like. Maybe she was between niches. Maybe she was, you know, sort of able to exploit lots of niches on the margins of other niche space. But either way, her position in those savanna ecosystems was something that was flexible and variable and probably incredibly advantageous. So the spotlight on Lucy is really about she could kind of do it all, right? It was her ability to adapt behaviorally, which feeds into this information about where you're getting your food, how you're getting your food, and how much you have to think about getting your food. So exploiting new kinds of dietary items in a way that gives you access to that higher quality nutrition, but in, in a sort of clever and probably tool-assisted way. So essentially, Lucy and her kind raised the bottom line. They were able to consistently get more calories in, expend fewer calories, whatever it was they were doing. And even if I can't tell you exactly what it was they were eating, we can, again, start to put some guardrails around it. So finding new foods was probably an important part of this. Um, I've argued that starting to exploit the inside bone nutrients of things like marrow, right, this sort of fatty, rich um, inside part of bone was a really important part of that. But either way, we're looking at um, a flexible organism that was doing something important and different uh, in their diet. I think we can also blame Lucy for our cravings, because clearly the carbohydrates, the lipids, the things that we love are the things that she loved. She just simply didn't have access to them in the same way that we do. And um, this is kind of a 
a fun way to look at it. I'm, I'm working with David Robbenheimer now a little bit on trying to understand to the extent to which we can reconstruct what a diet like could have been, even if we don't know necessarily exactly what it was. And so what you've got is, I hope I don't cut my slides out here, but you've got an axis here that shows you increasing protein and increasing fat. So if you've got something like a potato and you measure its like fat content, its protein content, and its carbohydrate content, there's three numbers there, right? And so two of these numbers are here and here. And then by inference, the third number is there, right? Because if you have something that's 20% fat and 20% protein, then that's 40%, right? And then what's the other 60%? And if you've normalized it to carbohydrates, that means you're going to have more carbs going this way. So you can see that wild rice you know, has not that much protein. It has a ton of carbs. It doesn't have much fat in it. And then this is the sort of recommended human diet, modern human diet in this like, gray area. So eat lots of Chinese broccoli. I think we ate Chinese broccoli last night, didn't we? So that's good. Um, but you know, nuts, they're very high in lipids. Um, they're pretty good on protein, not a lot of carbs in that. So this kind of gets you an idea of like, what am I actually eating? Um, now what's available to Lucy, and particularly in these kind of savanna ecosystems, that could have been nutrient rich? Well, I've already talked a little bit about tubers um, and how high they are in fiber. Um, but if we want to map our cake on here, we can see that that's like mostly carbs, honestly. Lots of fat too, but mostly carbs a little bit more protein in a hamburger. I used McDonald's um, as a standard for this one. I'm sure you can get different hamburgers, but they're way down in this area. So we can think of this as like the cravings we have and then our ability to actually fulfill those cravings is pretty extreme right now. And Lucy would have been maybe exploring out into these sorts of other types of foods that other primates we know don't really exploit. And they can't exploit because they don't use the tools in the same way to do so. Um, and, and also cooperation and so on. So our, our sort of tuber can go down there. Honey, of course, down there, super. It's basically just sugar. It's also the most preferred food of um, modern hunter-gatherers. They always want the honey before they want anything else. Um, and then, when you think about meat, it's going to be either high protein and low carbs, or it's going to end up up here, and it's going to be very high fat. And that depends on what part of the animal it is you're exploiting. So if you're going for the brains and the inside bone marrow, then you're going to be basically eating a stick of butter. And then if you're going for the meat, that's super lean. And that's what you're going to end up uh, consuming is mostly protein. So we can't think of like these resources as just this or that, but a combination of things that Lucy species may have started to clue in on as exploitable in different ways with different kinds of tools and different kinds of approaches. So this is a, a graphic that we had in, um, in our paper. And basically, we're just kind of looking at how it was they would have gotten access to these sorts of resources. Um, I don't think that, that Lucy was out um, hunting big game, but there was plenty of big game available. And those inside bone nutrients are going to remain on the landscape inside the carcass a lot longer than the stuff that's on the outside, you know, the meat and, the, and all of the rotten stuff. So what we would love to do is be able to go out into the field or continue to go out into the field and actually develop some hypotheses about what the kind of evidence is for when we would need to start um, observing this kind of behavior might have been present. At what point in time does this occur? And this is one of the most wonderful things I was able to do with the late Bill Kimball was he was really interested in this question. And for a decade, he wanted to do a bone modification study where we surveyed those landscapes. You know, we start at 3.4 million and we survey everything and we pick up all the nasty little bone scraps that nobody else wants to look at and we look at them. And we check to see, are there marks on them that indicate butchery? And then we go up the section and we do it at 3.3. And then we go up the section and we do it at 3.2. And we check to see, does, does it look like there's a change in the behavior, the actual archeological record? What can that tell us about diet? So thank you to everybody for being here. Thank you for caring about Lucy. Thank you for caring about diet. And um, thank you for being such a welcoming audience today.